Benjamin Crocker, thanks so much for coming on to 27 Roche. My pleasure, Scott. Good to be here with you. Before we dive into some of the more fun stuff related to music and musicology, I want to ask how you found yourself in America. You're a handsome young Australian man, larrikin by some definitions. Um, if you don't know what that means, you can Google it to the audience members. But you could have stayed in Australia. You could have gone to the UK uh, where visas and stuff are very easy for Australians. Um, how do you find yourself pulling a Tocqueville in America? Yeah, well, good question, Scott. Uh, I guess music was kind of the departure point. Uh, you know, I was I was doing a lot of music. I was teaching full time in Australia. In Australia, yeah. yeah. And then uh, during the, the pandemic came, I was teaching full time and doing you know increasing amounts of, of you know gigs on the side. Then the pandemic came. Playing or conducting? Conducting, yeah, on the side. And then uh, when the pandemic came, it shut everything down. Right. So there's no music on the weekends. Uh, and so I did two things. Right. This, it was kind of going into winter in Australia at the time. Uh, I, I made myself a better skier because the only place you could go was like the, the ski resort. Like Threadbow and yeah, Perisher. And Perisher, yeah. yeah. And I, I read more. Okay. And, you know, I had my head in all this political philosophy. You know, the books I was reading were getting, you know, more interesting because of what was actually happening in America at the time. And it felt like this. You talking so, about like Herodotus or who? Or what do you? Yeah, well, no, I was I was reading. Um, you know, I started you know with John Stuart Mill. You know, trying to understand this idea of on liberty. You know, the harm principle, that kind of thing. And then I was you know saying, well, I want to understand the regime itself more. So then I went towards Plato and trying to get into the Republic. We'll talk about Plato. He's in this little yeah, great, this little printout. Great, great. But um, no. So it, all that's to say that the, the place I found these ideas resonating was when I was watching the news and I was saying, what what's happening in America? What is this thing that everyone seems to be going crazy and you know the world historical people seem to be just melting down. Hmm. So the world historical people. What does yeah. that mean? Well, I, I mean, maybe that's a complex idea we can get into later. But you know, there's a Fair there's a strand in in um, historicism that that holds. You know, we have maybe Hegel to thank for this the most. That there's a there's a world historical people that you know at one time this was the Greeks and then at one time this was the Romans. Maybe it was the Germans. Maybe it was the British as well. And that America is the the people that you know carry history on their shoulders now. Okay. Um, so that's just that's my way of framing you know on the back of that reading mm. what America is. Sure. You know, the leaders of the world, the people that really matter in in the big picture right now. So this is all melting down, and I think well. I want to study something outside of music that helps me put this together. Mm. And I did actually look to England first because I thought, well, you know, that is the easiest place for an Australian to go. And then in the process of looking for scholarships to attend, um, you know, universities in the UK, England, I found yeah. this one um, particular scholarship actually to the United States, to St. John's College, mm. uh, where they would fund you to basically read the great books for two years. Yeah. And I... Uh, it's a two-year two program, the MA in yeah, Humanities? Yeah, it's a, it's a two-year program. Oh, we were thinking of doing it. I thought it was one year. Yeah, no, Are it's you, two years and two it's... Years? It's completely reading based and you read whole books. That's the other thing. You know, it's all not, primary sources, all primary sources. And you're not just, you know, picking and choosing different, you know, excerpts set by a tutor. You read like Pythagoras to learn about math. You can. I, they don't do that in the Graduate Institute, but they may cover that. But in that's, the, a, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the that, idea. Yeah. So the big thing for math is Euclid. So you, you go back to the beginning of geometry, yeah. right? I, that's, I yeah. mean, you're taking me back on a trip to sixth grade. Yeah. Euclidean geometry. Yep. Yeah. So that's, that's St. John's. And I found in my trips to America when I was kind of thinking about coming here, you know, I was, I just became fascinated by the conversations that I was having with people when I was traveling around the country. See, the image that everyone gets of America outside of America is crisis, crisis, crisis. There's not that much nuance. Right. Okay. So it's like, Trump bad, everyone else good, or depending on what you're reading, you know, Trump good, everyone else bad, you know, we're sort of all familiar with that meme, right? Yeah. You hit the ground and you go outside the cities and that picture starts to become really interesting yeah. and nuanced. And that's what I was finding was happening when I was traveling here before actually moving here. So, you but know- the it, experience on the ground was much more nuanced than yeah. what you get behind a television screen in Sydney. Yeah, big time. So, I mean, I, for example, I came to New York once. I, I had a friend of mine in upstate New York who I had just assumed came from a liberal family because he was 
a pretty liberal guy. And, uh, you know, I walk into his house, and he's lovely, lovely parents, right? And th his dad comes out and he's just like, yeah, I, I got your Trump bed sheets ready. We <laughs> love Trump in this house. <laughs> and I thought, okay, th this is not what I expected. Yeah. You know? So, you know, that picture just started to build and I, I had interesting conversations with people in this country about why it is the way it is. Mm. And I, I couldn't look away and I, I felt like I had to come here and, and actually put music to one side for a little while and investigate. I think in a lot of ways, America is the pinnacle of the enlightenment, the culmination of, say, 100, 150 years of thought, uh, or probably closer to 200, but, you know, say, you should want to end, end of the 16th century um, forward to about, you know, beginning of the 19th century, something like that. Um, y the idea that they were going to create a democratic republic was fundamentally at the time an experiment. Um, and the country into which America grew, one of immigrants from all over the world where you're defined by values, shared values rather than race, religion, ethnicity. There were problems, of course. Slavery was a horrible tarnish um, on, uh, on, on America's story. Um, and it, it absolutely wasn't perfect. But the idea that that we're going to experiment with this thing, like let's let's give this a try. We're going to throw out monarchs. Um, we're going to have a democratic republic. Was it was a new idea, and it led, of course, to the French Revolution and then the Atlantic Revolutions all over Latin America. Um, now I don't I don't know that America today is a pinnacle of the enlightenment. First of all, other countries have had time to blossom and flourish and clean up some of their issues. And America, because it's a young country, uh, has not worked out all of its issues. You know, America only celebrated its its bicentennial uh, not that long ago. You and I will live through the tricentennial. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, when, I, when I'm reading Democracy in America, or when mm -hmm. I'm reading some of these early accounts of what it was like. And then you read things now like, say, Hillbilly Elegy, uh, the J.D. Mm. Vance book. Yeah, J. Whatever, J. One Vance, thinks yeah. of, whatever one thinks of J.D. Mm -hmm. Vance and what he's done in politics and whatnot, like that was a very revealing book for a lot of people. It does show that there's a lot of nuance. Or this comedian Theo Vaughn, you yeah, know, that everyone yeah. likes. Um, he plays a kind of, the kind of character, the the hick, the Southern, <laughs> you know. Chris, where's, yeah. where's he even from? Where's I think he's from New Orleans, possibly. Yeah, he, he, he is from Louisiana. I know that yeah. much. Yeah. 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 Um, but that you know, it's kind of tropey. But like, I I was in New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, last year for a, a Quillette party, um, and then you know, I, I was I was in Miami for another thing. Uh, I I grew up in New York. These are disparate places, my friend. I was in Nashville mm -hmm. also uh, visiting a former colleague. Um, Nashville, New Orleans, New York, Miami, LA. This is this is not something you would expect to see in the same country. These are all worlds unto themselves, mm. first of all. Um, and so it is a very peculiar, weird place mm. with a lot of good and a lot of uh, areas to be improved. But when, when you talk about the nuance, it's like the outsider coming in, looking mm. at this, it reminds me of de Tocqueville, of this French guy who comes and, you know, is just kind of like surveying and observing for a while. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, look, no one no one of us should pretend to be anything like de Tocqueville, right? <laughs> like that's, I've said this to people before, like you read Tocqueville, it's like listening to Mozart. It's like there is something ingenious about every sentence that that guy writes. It's, Are you a fan? I can't tell. Yeah, big fan. <laughs> I mean, you know, just in case you didn't notice. Um, but I, I would put it this way, like I, I've often thought about this. Uh, what would Tocqueville think if he had the time and the world was, you know, configured a bit differently and he could compare these giant new world continental nations, right? America and Australia. They're roughly the same size. Okay. It, it, America, you know, Australia is what, like 80% the land mass? Mostly. Uh, yeah, 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 but yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you've got like two continents, uh, two sort of roughly continental spanning yeah, nations, sure. right? Yeah. Um, almost similar in shape. They have similar coastal climes. 
But then Australia is like radically different in the middle. Like it's just all desert. And aside from the fact that Australia just has a lot less people, one of the big things that that does is it really pushes Australians into this kind of hyper urbanized way of living because everyone's kind of like, well, you can't well, you live can't in the middle. you can't live in Uluru, I so, mean, right? Yeah, and this, this has like fascinating consequences, right, for the difference between these kind of – these are the two big continent-spanning New World nations. But in the case of America, um, you've got, you know, civilization just really kind of spreading itself constantly through the middle and developing all these, you know, different nuances and, and different ways of life. And then in Australia, you've got people sort of like, oh, we're still – there together. So that's all to say that when you come to an America as an Australian versus, say, uh, and be a European who carries the old world with them a little more, mm. um, you see on the one hand this striking familiarity, this kind of freshness. Well, I'm, this is essentially a liberal notion. I can just make myself what I need to be in this world. On the other hand, you see, you know, divisions and you see differences that seem insurmountable because maybe just sh purely by geography, people have gotten used to living differently mm. and somehow making that work together. So that's, that can be really striking, you know, for, I mean, I know it is for me and it's, it's actually pretty difficult to figure out because you could go, well, okay, well, we've got all this in common, but there seems to be something fundamental about America that we don't mm. naturally understand. Who's we? Yeah, Australians. Yeah. Yeah, you know. So we have we have the new world thing, we get that, we get the freshness of invention and, and um, you know, the, the quality of being one's own man, but uh, we, we struggle with, wow, how, how does this actually work with this scale of difference? Give you an example, right? Um, you just don't see in Australia, the division between neighborhoods that you do in, I don't want to say most cities in America, but mm. like a lot of places yeah. in America. So let's take New Haven, for example. Mm. The difference between the last street of Yale and the town of New Haven itself, <laughs> I was talking about this with a colleague from yeah. Yale last night. It's like, it's just night and day. And we're just, we're just not used to that. Uh, Jacksonville, Florida, the difference between going from Ponte Vedra and, you know, the beach club and... You know, there's yeah. almost like there's a, you know, this change of worlds. Uh, and that's that's probably the biggest thing that I've gone, wow, I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what to make of this. And there's probably legacies of um, slavery and racial division built into that. But I don't think that's the only antecedent to the way that America is. No, not at all. I mean, we don't need to get into like – welfare policies and why certain mm. neighborhoods have continued to stay poor year after year despite, you know, a revolving door of politicians coming in right, promising right. to fix things. Um, this isn't a policy analysis podcast <laughs> uh, necessarily. I, it could be. But that dichotomy is interesting. I, I've been toying with the idea of what I call subculture theory. Right. Uh, I haven't written a definitive document on this yet, but I've been playing around with it, talking to different people about it. And it's this idea, and give me some, give me some mm -hmm. rope here, mm -hmm. uh, but it's this idea that one product of evolution is that w we, we like fitting into groups, right? Mm -hmm. We like fitting into uh, clubs of, of, other individuals who share interests or characteristics with us mm. um, because it makes us feel safe. And I, I think there's there's a lot, a fair bit of evolutionary backing to this of like you hang out with, a, a you know, a gaggle of people, a gang of people so that you can go hunting together, mm. so that you can share, you know, meat at the end of the hunt. Um, and what the, the modern manifestation of this is that there is – infinite subcultures, there's infinite atomization, especially in America. Like you could argue that one could argue, and I would probably argue that most that America participates in a profound, a profound cultural mercantilism where our main export is not products or automobiles or tobacco, mm -hmm. it's culture. 
you see a TikTok trend or whatever appear in America, it will get to Australia mm -hmm. a couple weeks or a couple months later. It'll get to France a couple weeks or a couple months later. Right. And so film, our main culture, I have another theory that mm -hmm. when we were finished expanding out west, we reached we reached the seaboard, right? Mm -hmm. We went from sea to shining sea, manifest destiny, that we couldn't go any further west, so we went up, and that that's why Hollywood was created. That's why Hollywood is in Los Angeles. We can't go out anymore, so we go up, and we start you know, creating things. That's why the cinema industry is in California. That's just my my hunch. Maybe there's other good reasons for it. Yeah, so, that, <laughs> so that's interesting. I mean, I... I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm warm to that, to that theory. I, I'm Which no, one, the, the Hollywood to, one or the subculture? Well, to the fact that we, we, you know, America pushed westward and then it had nowhere else to go. But then I sort of think, well, was the moon, you know, a, a well, we also a we did, we did with through some soft power and hard power. Yeah. One could argue, act as an empire for much of our existence. Right. Right. Um. You know. But the subculture thing, and coming back to mm -hmm. what you were saying, you have all these different groups in America. You have the, and we'll talk about some of the music groups. Mm -hmm. You know, the rave kids, yeah. the rap kids. You know, the tech, the 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 techno heads. Um, there's a huge, huge Hispanic community uh, in New York and in many other parts yeah. of the United States. In some places in the U.S., the the signs are in Spanish. Like in Miami, I remember the signs, yeah, yeah, the signs yeah. are in Spanish. Yeah, announcements um, at airports. I mean, yeah, we don't we don't have that. We actually, I've got to say, we we've got like a tiny, um, you know, proportion of Australia has some street signs in Chinese. Hmm. Um, that's like a little. That's about as far as it gets. But I mean, it's not it's not culturally diverse the way the United States is. And but I mean, I think the internet has also pushed this to to the nth degree. I mean, you have the anime kids, the gamer kids, you have right. the Twitch people. Right. There's a sub community for absolutely everything mm -hmm. in a, in a in a fetishized kind of way. That whatever your interest, like you'll find other people, and you can do it anonymously. Reddit is anonymous. Mm -hmm. You can find your group of people, mm -hmm. and so you come to a city like New York or Philadelphia or whatever, and you talked about how you know in New Haven it drops off like. The, the dichotomy between Yale and cert, like certain uh, inhab like quarters of mm -hmm, New Haven mm -hmm. is completely different. It's night and day. It's a totally different way of life. Here, we have a little bit of that. It's less of a precipitous drop off. You see more of that in a place like probably Philadelphia, mm -hmm. the like yeah, sharp yeah. decline from block to block. I certainly saw it in, in Buenos Aires in some areas, mm -hmm. like some areas really nice next to areas that yeah. you don't want to go into. Um, Certainly not as a gringo who doesn't speak very good Spanish, but you know you, you learn the hard way. Um, here, it's it, it, the the cultural diversity of being able to eat any kind of cuisine you want that you could possibly imagine. You have it in London, of course, too, mm -hmm. and in other great metropolises. But there's an atomization of tons of different subcultures which come together in places like New York, but also throughout America. It's not just New York, you could argue is the capital of the world. Like you see it in many other American cities as well. Mm -hmm. Like different groups of people with different interests kind of coexisting. The little suburb where everyone looks the same, speaks the same way, mm -hmm. uh, all votes for the same candidate is not I mean, it exists certainly, but I I don't know, and I probably don't think that that's the majority. We have a lot more hmm. of a melting pot and like a mosaic than uh, than sort of quarter. It's not like quartered. There is quartered off areas, of mm -hmm. course. There's the country clubs and this and that, but like it seems to be this mixture of tons of different people with the kinds of people with tons of different interests that are all coexisting somewhat peacefully. We're not having civil war. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I mean, I, I can certainly see, are you talking about New York or are you talking about like the, in general across the country? I guess my sample size is New York, but I don't take New York to be representative of the country. Right. I mean, I guess what, I mean, getting back to Tocqueville, one of, one of the themes that kind of emerges from, from that book, Democracy in America is this inevitable, um, movement from a vertical society, right, uh, with let's the king at the top. Um, Benjamin down to Crocker. 
to the peasants. <laughs> I would not have qualified as a, as a king. I've, I've tracked my genealogy. Um, the king at the top and then the peasants at the bottom, right? But one of the things that, that emerges is that within this vertical society, uh, everybody kind of lives together. You know, you can't... Um, that, yeah, there's a hierarchy and that hierarchy is, you know, essentially unfair. That's kind of what life is. Um, but that um, atomization is prevented because <clears throat> whatever your social status... Because of a fixed caste system. You're, 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 you're there. You're, you're kind of like if you imagine like the world is just this line and then each society, there's there you go. Everyone's right. together. Now what Tocqueville is saying is that as the democratic age unfolds, that structure is going to flatten mm. and that it's in itself contributes to this atomization of the individual. This okay, is so, like, yeah. so this is kind of can be, you know, um, I guess explained in a way is like, well, this is this might explain why we have suburbs. Yeah, okay, it's got to do with building technology and all the rest of it. But the instinct to separate increasingly, I mean, if you go like to, to other states, you look at North Carolina, for example, I mean, just look at what's being built there. These are atomized communities. They, they're being pushed outwards. Uh, and that, I think, is sometimes understood as just the inevitable re, uh, result of progress, of um, technology, of, you know, just a market that works so we can have more stuff. But what Tocqueville has, I think, you know, trying to make us realize is that this is a source that might be actually inside the, the human soul that's coming more intrinsically in the democratic era. What, what is the what is the effect of spreading out to different suburbs? You say that that's a flattening of of social caste of of, of, of like a fixed class system. Yeah, well, it's it's not necessarily, it, man. There's like rich suburbs and poor suburbs. Sure, sure. But if you look at at what's actually happening to the individual when they separate, so the individual in New York, right? Uh, New York is closer to an old world society than your average, you know, new American suburb. I mean, that's obvious, right? But what's actually happening internally within New York? Well, the people on the bottom um, can see the people at the top. They actually live like pretty close together. They can see that there's a social hierarchy there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We don't like it, right? But it, it kind of, it has an order to it. Now, you move people into the suburbs and every man becomes his own king. But what do we lose in that process? Okay, so that, that's a, that might be a good thing. You've kind of, yeah, you've got more freedom, you've got more space, you've got your own car, you can do whatever you want, you don't have to put up with the noise from your neighbors, but um, you lose some knowledge of, okay, where's my, my place? Not necessarily in the external world all the time, but internally, where, where does the soul kind of fit? Mm. It's, just an, it's, an, it's an interesting, um, you know, it's an interesting state of affairs to kind of examine. Well, look, I mean, I we're going to get into music in a second. Yeah. This is all very fascinating, and I enjoy talking about this, but we, we might as well milk you for your expertise while you're here. Um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I flippantly said you can't live in Uluru before. Actually, I think some people do live in mm -hmm. Uluru, so I'd like to correct myself. But most of the center of Australia, also my foot's just falling asleep. Um, I blame Chris. Um most of the center of Australia is somewhat uninhabitable, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, and so my question is, can technology not solve? I mean, perhaps we should ask someone who knows mm -hmm. about sustainable development, <laughs> rather than me, uh, you know, joking around about this. But like, you talk about the impulse to separate. Australia is not separated. You have people in Adelaide, mm -hmm. Sydney, Melbourne, a, a, a few million people in Perth, mm. which is one of the most isolated cities in the entire yeah. world. As I think I think it's the the most isolated capital city in the world. Yeah, it's a it's an interesting phenomenon. Perth. I mean, it yeah. does, it's why is Perth there? Yeah. Even well, Australians admit that because yeah, of the it's mines. A weird place. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Darwin. I lived in Darwin. That's an absolute uh -huh. madhouse. But there's not a really a serious number of people who live there. Yeah. yeah. Um, but people are – for people who don't look at a map, but these are all coastal cities. No one lives in the middle of Australia. Like why can't technology solve for that? Yeah. So that this is a great question and I'm super excited to, to, to have a crack at answering it. 
I think uh, the point I was kind of making a few minutes ago is that America actually had a frontier. Are, are you saying that that is the result of mm. – we'll get to uh, Frederick Jackson Turner in a minute. Yeah. But are you saying that the result – the reason people are pushed onto the coasts mm -hmm. in Australia rather than being – I mean, but these are like metropolises. Is the reason that people are pushed onto the coasts some kind of anti-monarchical impulse? Uh, no, I don't. I don't think so. I mean, there may be, there may be, you know, things that contribute. You know, it's a, it was a penal colony, so that's what I'm thinking. They were kind of under the thumb of the monarch, and then you know they had to sort of be together to get claw their way out of it. But I think it's this, right? Um, America actually had a frontier, and what I mean by that is it had explorable terrain with the tools of the time. So if you were a person that that you know set out west and Lewis and Clark. you know yeah you get past the Shenandoah Valley or whatever and then you find your patch of land uh, you know uh you could kind of make do with that just with yourself and and your family and maybe a small community around you yeah, yeah, now yeah. you can't do that in Australia so you go you go west in Australia just die. you get over the blue mountains and your shovel is not enough to make a living for you i mean it's just it requires um you know, a technology that we just didn't have yet. Now, the reason I'm excited about this from for my country is I think we're at the stage technologically where Australia can actually have a frontier. And what I mean by that is a lot of the, the wealth of the country is under the ground. It's in mineral wealth. Um, if you're looking to technologies that are seeking to get the most out of solar power, well, we have a lot of land uh, and we have a lot of sunlight. Mm. Uh, so, you know, fast forward, you know, a couple of hundred years from when the British, you know, landed uh, at at, um, at Botany Bay, in 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 which is now modern day Sydney, you have the opportunity to actually push west uh, in a way that might reward enterprise, uh, and and more more importantly than than individual enterprise, reward enterprise that cooperates more and more. Uh, in the kind of market that could generate some some real wealth for for Australians, not least for Indigenous Australians who have actually, um, you know, found ways um, to live on this land, you know, for you know thousands upon thousands of years before Europeans arrived. Um, now, the challenge that my country is going through at the moment is how do you apprehend the needs of you know, those two communities, which in some cases do remain quite distinct, especially when you go into um, into rural and regional Australia. Um, you know, but that's that's a that's a debate I'm glad we're having, you know, we, and we need to work through it because the opportunity there to sort of tap that Australian frontier uh, is really, really exciting. And, you know, we can live sophisticated lives now in areas that seemed like impossibly... Uh, difficult to make do with a hundred years ago. Frederick Jackson Turner uh, and his frontier thesis are some right. of the seminal works, I think, in understanding America as mm. as a country, but also as an idea. The significance of the frontier cannot be understated for us. So to hear you talking about the potential, and not a lot of countries have a, a frontier. I right. mean, you talk about uh, frontier markets, right? Like emerging markets. Right, right. Um, in that sense, you know, I I understand, but like there, there's not a lot of like Western countries um, uh, that have a frontier to explore. So what happens in Australia is going to be an interesting thing to mm. watch and if you'd like to borrow a shovel uh i'd be happy to <laughs> to make one with with a blacksmith and gift it to you yeah i i, I think so now we, we should talk about music soon but i wanted uh, on the topic of music i wanted to say frederick jackson turner is is actually pretty important um I, I, we were just uh you know we met originally at a you common sense jackson no turner? me and you met yeah. at a common sense society fellowship yes where we, we were talking about uh, about music and western civilization and i've just come from one and I talked about Frederick Jackson Turner. What, in Scotland? Yeah, in Scotland. And I, we did one in, in, uh, in Hungary as well. I talked about Frederick Jackson Turner in the context of um, making Americans consciously aware that they were a, a frontier nation. 
Now you could you could look at it a couple of different ways, right? Like, you know, are we really a frontier nation uh, if we don't think of ourselves as a frontier nation? Is it, is it something conscious that we have to sort of imbibe, you know, and then propagate in our spirit, or or is it something that he was actually noticing in in the, the nature of America itself? So the, the point I made in in the context of music was that um, once America became aware of itself as a frontier nation. So once it was a self-conscious decision, and I think that's something that's, you know, inextricably linked with Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis, which I think was 1884. No, 93. Okay. It might have been 90. Yeah. I think it was 93. All right. Well, I know it, I know it, it appears roughly the same time as uh, Dvorak's New World Symphony, and that's why I raise it, because um, you can't sort of have the New World Symphony and have it make total sense um, without – thinking about America in a particular way. Mm. And I think that's where um, and that's where someone like Turner, um, you know, really gives something to the this, this self-awareness that a country has. Now, do we need something like that to happen in Australia to, to kind of, you know, um, turn us around and get us more adventurous and more ambitious to push west or, or if you're in Perth, push east? I don't know. Um, time will tell. Maybe it will just kind of happen organically or maybe the seeds of it are already um, you know starting to sprout already with the mining industry and the um you know the the way that entrepreneurs are trying to sort of cultivate the the interior of Australia now well there's cowboy life in Australia in the same way that there's cowboy life in Texas I had a Finnish friend right who rode around a motorcycle mm -hmm. uh, they have you know the working holiday he was doing a working holiday you got to work in a farm for 88 days um to get your second year mm -hmm. visa, uh, he he like rode around a motorcycle herding cattle. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there is there is a kind of frontiersman yeah. lifestyle that exists in places like Orange and mm -hmm. and places in other parts of Australia, the names of which uh, assume me. Um, yeah. The j uh, Jackaroo culture, I would call it. Yeah. Jackaroo. Yeah. Yeah. That's me. If you can't yeah. tell. <laughs> Um, you could make it as a Jackaroo, Scott. I, I probably could. I had an Akubra for a while. Yeah. Uh, I misplaced it. But down to music. Back to basics. Mm -hmm. What is music to you, Mr. Crocker? Good question. It changes from day to day. Um, but I think music, and I'm thinking about Neil Young here because we both read. We uh, did. David Samuels, yeah. who's been on this podcast. Wonderful piece yeah. in the New York Times Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, Neil Young's Lonely Quest to Save right. Music. Yeah, and, and Neil Young says, says words to the effect that music is a way uh, to cope with the world, to cope with life. Um, I don't want to lean too heavily on the word cope because that sort of means that if it were gone, <laughs> you'd be, you would have no hope. You'd, you know, you, everything is perpetually in a, in a negative state. Um, but it is. It, it, to me, uh, it's a way to put things right. It's a way to put things right internally. Mm. Uh, and if you have things right internally, then uh, your chances of living in community, which is, you know, what we have to do in this life, um, are significantly improved. So I think if, if I were to, to say it succinctly, music puts me right internally. There's a quote that comes to mind. I can't remember the mm -hmm. author of the quote but I wrote it down. I thought you'd appreciate. Mm -hmm. Music begins where words end. It is, an, it is an expression of that for which language is an, inadequ is an inadequate vehicle. I'll read that again because I stumbled. Mm -hmm. Music begins where words end. It is an expression of that for which language is an, inad is an inadequate vehicle. Okay. Yeah. I mean that's a nice quote. You know you don't know who who came up with it. I did. You did. Yeah, those are my words. Wow. I did okay. know who came up with that. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay, well let me let me let me challenge it. I, I, it's not really a challenge, but let me say, um, there seems to be a presupposition that words come before music. They do. Plato's Plato's cave, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if you have something perfect, well, I mean, let's assume that the realm of human mm -hmm. emotion mm -hmm. or the, the meaning of existence and all of these lofty ideas, like they're, they're up here right. somewhere, right? And where, you know, us, uh, 
what's the word for a cave dwelling person? Um, a, uh, a troglodyte. Yeah, a troglodyte. Yeah. Us, us troglodytes are, and the Neanderthals, I don't think, lived in caves, but that's irrelevant. Okay. Us troglodyte, we troglodytes uh, sort of grasp for a meaning. I just read this wonderful mm -hmm. um, short story by Borges, uh, The Tower of mm -hmm. Babel, The Library of Babel. Um, are you familiar with the no, short not. story? No. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't need to go into a, a plot summary here, but um, it, it well, a, a little plot summary. He's in this, basically it describes this library that's infinite. It's greater than the span of the earth or like the whole mm -hmm. known Milky Way or whatever. Every book is 410 pages and every book in this library uh, is like a, a permutation or combination of, of everybody's life mm -hmm. slightly altered. So any possible imagined combination of people's lives and science and math and whatever are in this library. And one of the metaphors I guess you could take out of this is that people spend their whole lives like searching for this book, searching for meaning, the meaning of their life, the meaning of existence. When it's ultimately, I don't know if it's futile, but Borges seems mm -hmm. to suggest that it's futile. But getting back to this thing, you said that I presupposed that words come before music. Mm -hmm. I maintain that position, and I'll tell you why. Assuming you have the realm of human emotions, mm -hmm. the meaning of existence, all of these big things at the top, what are words? We troglodytes need to communicate with each other. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's evolutionary reasons for language, which evolved as a technology like anything else. Um, language is a way for us to communicate with each other, and some as a technology, different languages function in different ways. Some languages have the subjunctive. Some languages have the mm -hmm, conditional. Mm -hmm. The idea of a subjunctive is that you can express things which are not, yeah, right? Like yeah. if it were, mm -hmm. right? If it were the case. That's a powerful tool, my friend, mm -hmm. to be able to express something that isn't empirically observable, but to hold a thought in your imagination of what could happen. Some languages don't have that. They can only yeah, describe yeah. what is, mm -hmm. you know? And so... Language itself is our best effort at saying that the in the realm of forms, you have a perfect chair, right? Mm -hmm. And so I call this a chair. But this is a far cry from the chair in, in Plato's realm of forms, mm -hmm. right? And you can correct me. You've probably read more Plato than I have. We call this a chair because that's the best we can do to mm -hmm. describe what it is, to describe what this thing that holds holds our bosoms are, you know? <laughs> um language absolutely comes before music because what you can express in music, and I'm no conductor, mm -hmm. I can't even read music. I know F-A-C-E, every good boy deserves fudge. You know, that that's about yeah. the extent of my music well, composition. Well, it was fruit knowledge. when I was a kid, but <laughs> yeah, fudge uh, It deserves fruit, you know, it's because everyone's uh, <laughs> obese in America. You know, this is Ozempic is, you know, we should, we should get Ozempic to sponsor the podcast. Kidding. If you're taking one of these drugs, go to the fucking gym. Yeah. I'm serious. Yeah, Eat I, better, yeah, I, I agree. go to the gym, period. Runaway capitalism has led to just an epidemic of obesity of the mind and of the body. Yeah. Especially. Well, you're touching on Neil Young now as well. He has um, something to say about this. Uh, yeah. But let, let's go back. I absolutely yeah. believe that words come before music mm -hmm. because words are, they're not, they're not, the best way of communicating those things which we feel and the divine or the ethereal, but mm -hmm. they're the best we can do, yep. right? B before music. Music can capture some of that right. stuff. Not perfectly, but right? Or yeah. way in okay. here. Okay, so I, I don't disagree with with anything you've said there, right? And and uh, let, so let me qualify what I mean. Um, yeah, absolutely in... in um, in terms of, you know, framing the human experience, our, our self-understanding, right? Yeah, I, I don't disagree for a second. There was, there was speech uh, and then there was music. Uh, what I mean oh, by... Music, you could argue, is a technology as right, well. But we'll right. get into, we'll get into what, I, what I mean by um, this presupposition, particularly when we say something like um, music starts where words end. Okay. Now, yes, of course, in, in, um, in the sense of how we interact with uh, speech and with music. No, no question that that's true. Um, what I try to think about though is that music does, I think, arise from something that is more fundamental than speech because 
um, what constitutes music? Well, uh, harmony, melody, and rhythm. And harmony, melody, and rhythm are preserved in music um, in a way that is more pure than the way that speech kind of draws on those things. You know, like say speech has a rhythm, um, but it's it's the definition of what words mean isn't kind of drawn out of that. Now you're dealing with, um, you know, as people like Pythagoras recognized in harmony, melody, and rhythm, particularly harmony, that you're, you, you were trying to um, find an oral picture of the very constitution of the universe itself. So when, when I make the argument for music being prior to speech, that's the kind of Im imaginative picture I'm trying to get at, mm. that um, there, are, there are elements that constitute music that are best preserved in music uh, in a more pure um, recognition of what those elements are. Now, speech... No, 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 slow down here. You're talking about mm -hmm. maybe God, maybe divine, depending on... Well, just, okay, so take... Ethereal th things right. from... Yeah, take, take, take the idea, for example, that... From that, the realm of forms. That there is a, um, that there is a harmony to the, to the universe, okay? And this, is, this was, um, you know, the, the, the Pythagorean um, mm -hmm. music of the spheres. Now, I don't claim in any way to be expert in, in this, but um, there is something to the idea that there is a natural resonance in different harmonies that just clicks. For example, um, an octave is a, you know, more naturally resonant uh, harmony than, you know, a second. Okay. So preserved in music is something absolutely true about the world. It, it you know, it's the, the frequency at which air vibrates in sound. There's something, there's something just true in music. Um, then that's fundamental to music. So I think in that sense, uh, you know, the organization of sounds, which I think is a, is a reasonable definition of, of music. It probably needs some work apart from that. Um, I think that that is something that we can say comes prior to speech in a way. Now, in, in the conceptions, as you've laid it out, I don't disagree at all. I think our, our, our human need for expression, our human need to give definition to the lives we lead, uh, lead um, yeah, words come. And then when we run out of words to say, then music can take over. But why can music take over? Music well, predates both speech and music is part of just the fundamentals of the world. Yeah. Well, the, the elements of music, yeah, um, and, we, you know, we could split hairs about, okay, when did music actually arise? Was it, you know, I, I think, you know, you know when in the um, 2001 A Space Odyssey where the, yeah. the bone goes up and, you know, this is, you know, man has weapons. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I was reading a book recently. I think it was called The History of Western Music or A Concise History of Western Music. It was like, well, at some point, you know, someone in a cave f found a way to put holes in a bone and then we had a flute. Um, but the point is the elements of music um, predate, um, you know, our, our invention of speech mm. and Maybe that you know, maybe those two statements are actually quite congruent because in order to express something further than speech, you have to actually go to something that's more fundamental. What you're talking about reminds me of physics. It reminds me of the quantum mm. world, probably because I've just seen Oppenheimer twice. Yeah, it's a good our, movie. Yeah, with our director of operations, mm. uh, David. Um, who can't be here today, but uh, it's a wonderful movie mm. and I have never formally studied physics. Um, I had uh, instruction in the other the other main scientific disciplines, chemistry and biology, mm -hmm. uh, but I never, uh, in biology more than chemistry, I hated chemistry in high school. Um, I never studied physics in a classroom setting. Mm -hmm. I learned a bit of my own. Uh, and I did, well, I took, I took astrophysics in, in mm -hmm. uni actually. Um, but that way I was more interested in the 
there was some math and equations there, but I was I was interested in like stars. Stars are awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, and our universe. The class was called, I think, our universe. Okay. Uh, so, or maybe the universe. Well, I didn't take that class. <laughs> <laughs> stars for stoners. Um, what you're describing about the music being kind of uh, uh, primitive and just mm. predating humans, predating maybe all mm. existence uh, reminds me of the physical world. And I think there's a, I don't know, have you studied physics formally or is there, you see there's overlap between physics and, and, yeah, and musicology? I mean I mean, is it fields the, of study? Are musicologists trained in physics? Are the physics physicists like to listen to classical music? I mean, I, I wish they were, and it's it's one of the things that um, somebody I, should write a thesis about. Oh, look, this. look, people have, and, and it's something something that you know. When I'm sure you've had this experience, right? You say so you have your education, and then you get to a certain point, and you go, "Oh man, I wish I could go back and engineer that the right way, so that I learned this before I learned that, and then I learned this before I learned that." Or maybe you don't have that that feeling. I do all the time. And one of the things that I constantly think about is, man, it would be great for musicians to understand physics a little bit more uh, earlier in their professional education uh, to, to become a musician so that you can, you know, more easily find that, that bridge from um, the music that you make um, to finding order in the world around you. Hmm. I think it's really, really important. When I was an undergraduate, uh, you know, I was studying, this would have been like 2007. No, 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 you're confused. You're confused. This is probably like early 1900s, yeah. late 1800s, <laughs> yeah, something well, like the, that. The education problem might have yeah. been a bit better then. But yeah. um, when I was an undergraduate, we, we actually had, this was crazy, but this we were in our orchestration class and we were... Um, we had to compose a short piece for brass ensemble. And this kid came in from the music technology department and we didn't really mix with them very often. But, you know, he filled up the you know, whiteboard. It was very, very big, maybe half the size of this wall behind us. And he basically just gave us a, uh, you know, a masterclass in the physical properties of brass instruments. What's actually happening when you blow a trumpet? How does the air vibrate? Oh, Why wow. does it sound a particular way? Yeah. And I, I, can, I, for the life of me, Scott, I cannot recall it, right? But I remember sitting there and going, oh, man, we've, we've got this all backwards. Like we're, we're trying to construct <laughs> this world of sound using theory, but we're not observant enough of, you know, the, the, the physics of how this actually fits together. So, I mean, I would love to see um, – more physics making its way into music education. But, um, you know, like with all curriculums, there's a limit to what you can fit in, you know, how many practice hours are you going to give up to learn about how the world works? Yeah. 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 I think about that movie whiplash, um, mm. practice hours. Okay. Romanticism. Romanticism arose as in some ways a response to the enlightenment. Um, mm. it, a response to the scientism of the Enlightenment, mm -hmm. right? So Schrumendrang, this mm -hmm. German concept of Schrumendrang, mm -hmm. uh, of uh, how would we translate this? Like, like storm and stress or storm yeah. and, and we call it struggle? Storm, storm and stress. Storm yeah. and stress. Yeah. Among the romantics, in addition to mm -hmm. Goethe, obviously, uh, were people like Schiller, mm -hmm. like musical musical composers. I don't know anything about Schiller or mm -hmm. about music. So it's time for Ben to give us a little sound bite mm -hmm. on Schiller, romanticism, a response to the enlightenment, a response to scientism. What was so special about this guy and why I, who doesn't know a whole lot about music history, know this gentleman's name? Mm -hmm. Well, I, Scott, I, if you're looking to me for a masterclass, you'll be disappointed. I don't know much about Schiller either. Um, you know, I know romantic music, perhaps. Then, yeah, I mean, I could, I could certainly talk to that. Um, romantic music um, in a, in historical context. Here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So what you're essentially doing is, you, when you're looking at romantic music, you're you're looking at um, 
an, an increasing tension in the form that's been built up through the Baroque, through the classical, um, and the need of the individual soul to express himself. The Baroque predated the Enlightenment, right? This is like Louis, well, Louis, Bach, Louis who the Sixteenth. Yeah, I mean Bach, uh, who was the the um, you know the the you know these are great gold, the, the great gold master architecture, of the and I, um, I think is born in sixteen eighty eight. Okay. Okay. So yeah. it's roughly coincident with the with the Enlightenment. Um, so you have you know relatively rigid forms which have been built up you know through um, the Bach Bach sons Johann Christian Bach is really really important, and then you have Haydn and Mozart who um, kind of establish you know you know, the, the way that the symphony functions. So let's just keep our, keep our eyes on the symphony. It's, that's, that might be useful. Um, and yes, are in, incredibly creative souls, but they are really um, true to form and they're bound by form. Now, with the rise of the, you know, the radical individual and the romantic idea, um, you start to see the forms come into tension with the need for the individual to express himself. So then you have, after Mozart, you have Beethoven. And Beethoven writes... You read what, my mind. Beethoven writes what you, um, you know, you might describe as the first really revolutionary music. He knows about the, the French Revolution. Um, he what does is, that mean? How do you encompass the sentiments of disgruntled peasants and music i mean i suppose you can encompass anything first of all by mm. the way beethoven i think normal people were not listening to beethoven how would they have there was no technology for it they would need to go listen to him mm. in person which they obviously couldn't afford to do or to travel to the places where he was yeah. performing so this this is this is an important point so uh, Beethoven himself writes, I guess you could say, in a revolutionary spirit. So he's inspired by events of the age. Is his music always getting to everyone? No, not, certainly not in the way that it is today. Um, but if you just look at the form and we keep it like focused on the, the, the construction of the music itself, you have this romantic idea which starts to come into conflict with the constraints of form. Mm. So, um, you know, the symphony becomes longer um, the ideas within the symphony um, s start to sort of demand, um, you know, an, a, a, an exposition and a, a reckoning that is not going to be as simple as just like, here's a passage, um, let's repeat it um, and let's package it together and that's one movement and then we move on to the next. So mm. you start to, to hear physically in the sound um, some, some distress at, at the individual needing to sort of just say what the individual has to say, mm. but trying to keep it confined in a, a logical form that's been developed in the tradition of classical music. Now, um, Beethoven actually does this, you know, remarkably well. That's why he is, you know, revered as the genius that he is. But his music is still um, revolutionary. You know, you have um, the, the the third symphony um, with its, you know, beautiful... Um, you know, funeral march in, in the middle. Um, and then you get to the fifth symphony where you have then, as well as the, the, the form, um, you know, starting to, to kind of come under stress, you have the orchestra itself come under stress. So what does Beethoven do? Well, he adds a piccolo. What does that mean? Okay, so... How does the orchestra come under stress? Well, so physically, the forces that Beethoven uses. So he's not the first person to use trombones in a symphony, but he is probably like the first, you know, big composer to use trombones. They appear in the Fifth Symphony. Now, what does a trombone do? It's still to this day the loudest instrument in the symphony orchestra. So that adds a kind of terror and, and, and stress and, and volume to the orchestra. He also adds the piccolo. First time piccolo has been used in the symphony. What's the piccolo? Well, to this day, is the highest instrument in the symphony orchestra. What is a piccolo? A piccolo for... is, a very, is a small flute. Okay. Okay. So there's there's the piccolo. And what does he also add in the fifth symphony? He adds the contrabassoon. The contrabassoon is the lowest instrument to this day, commonly played in a symphony orchestra. So you have the physical bounds of the orchestra start to just blow up, mm. right? Uh, and that 
doesn't serve the form of the music. That serves the expressive capacity of the individual soul, the composer as the individual romantic mm. soul. Okay. So now we have this, this big chunky orchestra. And so we come on, we go through the fifth symphony, um, through the sixth symphony, and it's, it's you know, wonderful, expressive um, moment where Beethoven kind of writes a storm into the music in a way that perhaps we, we're not commonly used to hearing, you know, mm. literal depictions of nature um, or, or, or at least, um, you know, romantically inspired depictions of nature. And then we have um, the seventh symphony, the eighth symphony is rather brief, and then we get to the ninth symphony. And what does the, the, uh, the romantic soul of the composer demand? Well, the orchestra is not enough. So we have to add a choir. And then you have um, the ninth symphony emerges, you know, the, the, the genesis of the choral symphony where we have the huge force of, of the, the orchestra swelled to romantic proportions and the addition of the choir, which is, you know, singing a setting of Schiller's poem, Ode to Joy. Um, and it's sort of, you know, reaching the, the, the culmination of, uh, of where the, the the composer as an individual soul can find an expressive resonance. Mm. So w- within the lifetime of a singular composer, um, I, and I think the, 19, the Ninth Symphony comes in 1924, Beethoven is by this stage, you know, the revered um, you know, hero of musical Vienna. And within the span of Beethoven's lifetime, through his person, um, you see the, this manifestation of the romantic spirit in music and there are other figures then that that carry this on um robert schumann is very important some people argue more important than beethoven um and then brahms sort of carries the torch forward um but brahms also had a very good formal mastery as well you know, I, I would argue that brahms was a much less revolutionary composer in some respects than beethoven didn't didn't put the orchestra under the same sonic stresses that Beethoven did. Do you know what Beethoven's favorite fruit was? I do not. Banana. <laughs> you know, I have heard that. The last time I heard that was a fifth grader telling me that after school one day. It would well, have been t- about 10 years ago. Well, he's probably much more intelligent than <laughs> I. So also, I mean, this may be a silly question, but this is the place to ask. I'm always of the opinion, mm-hmm. by the way, that any question should be asked. You know, if you ask a question in a room yeah, and you yeah. think this is a silly question, mm-hmm. you'll find that other people had the same yeah, question. No, I wish I asked more silly questions. <laughs> First of all. And second of all, I prefer – there's this guy, Sahu Bloom, who mm-hmm. came on this podcast. He talks about – he's talked about this. Um, I would much prefer to be – the dumbest guy in a room full of smart people than the smartest guy in a room full of dumb people. Like I want to go to a room where I don't know that much about what's going on so that I can learn. Mm -hmm. So I will ask this question. How was Beethoven able to compose in the later years of his life as a deaf man? Was it all by Mm -hmm. memory? He he did lose his hearing. He slowly lost his hearing and then he lost it altogether, right? Yeah. So two two really interesting points on this. Uh, Firstly, uh, as a composer, you would be developing what, what we call your inner ear. So everyone has... You can hear music in your head? Yeah, everyone has an inner ear. Um, the more that you work in music, I would I would posit, so long as you're working well, the more that ear is developing. What does that mean? Like you can hear what's going to be pl- like a DJ, right. like knowing what the next song's going to okay. sound so, like? So my inner ear is, is relatively primitive compared to uh, some of my peers, right? Oh, I don't give yourself credit. Okay, I don't... Uh, consider myself able to hear extremely complex um, passages of orchestral music properly without actually hearing them a few times, okay? No, it gets better. The, you know, the older I get and the more... It gets trained. Yeah, yeah, it gets trained, it gets trained, you absorb, absorb, absorb. So what Beethoven is looking at by the time, you know, I mean, even at a relatively young age, this would, was a person that would have been able to conceive of the sounds of very complex, relatively complex uh, harmonies, um, conceive of the sounds of you know how melody would fit with that harmony, and vice versa, um, and put it together without physically you know having to you know hear it or even sometimes play it on the piano and things things like that. So 
basically it's it's the internalization of the composition process whereas if you're starting out as a composer let's say you you, you know you're you're, let's say you're not Mozart and you're you're 10 years old and you've taken music classes. Um, you would be saying, well, can you just, if you can play the piano, play that melody out and see if that fits or play that chord and see if that fits. And and does that work together or did that, well, did that work out in the real world the way it worked out in your head? No, Beethoven basically doesn't need to do that um, by the time he's, you know, um, reaching the end of his career. Now, let me put a little spin on that and say that some people have held that the reason Beethoven was able to be so revolutionary in sound is because he didn't have his hearing. And if you listen to passages of the Ninth Symphony, there are, there are parts, particularly, particularly at the end of the last movement, where the orchestra is under such stress that the, the singers, um, you know, the soprano and the mezzo are just wafting around up high and there's this sense that you know this is a little too uncomfortable sometimes like yeah, it is beautiful but maybe if he had actually been able to hear he would have softened the effect now that's mm. people speculating i've got to st- got to stress that but that is a well trod theory that that it's that it's the loss of beethoven's hearing um may have allowed that the purity of his romantic ideas to be written into the music in a way that had he gone, oh, I don't know if that's going to work. Oh, mate, this is this is fascinating. Yeah, so super fascinating. Yeah, It reminds me in some cases the best uh, uh, like – spies, best mm. agents of espionage, we right, could say, right. are sociopaths, are people yep. who can't, you know, tap into necessarily some things or sometimes uh, the best, um, you know, the best race car drivers or whatever just have like a, they have like a blunted, uh, a blunted, whatever mechanisms mm-hmm. uh, cause fear in us. They, they don't right. have that. I think right. of James Hunt, the, mm-hmm. you know, won the Formula One championship in 1976. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's kind of the mark of, well, it can be the mark of genius manifest in the world, right? Like you, you need a certain number of positive of traits. Atypical, well, you need to be atypical. You need yeah. to be neurodivergent. To right. Work. I think that's a but word. You, but it's, that it's, is a word. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's sometimes what you what you don't have yeah. uh, sometimes cons- well, conspires to create something pretty special. Yeah. Or, I mean, you look at, the, I mean, this is... I need to do more studies on this, but the idea of mania, right? Mm. Like what is obsession, right? You look at some of the most successful people of the world. Mm. These are not normal people. You look at Kobe, you look at Elon Musk. Mm -hmm. These are not normal people. These are people who are obsessed and they don't- Or perhaps deficient in some some normal ways. No, they are are deficient Mm. by whatever DSM-5 characteristic you want to say. Mm. Like they, they don't, they probably don't meet all the criteria mm-hmm. of a quote unquote normal person. Mm-hmm. To have that level of obsession, I think I think it can certainly be trained in some mm-hmm. people, but there's there's something about the the hardwiring there. There's I, I don't know exactly what it is. I'm not a scientist. Yeah. It it would be interesting to have someone on the show. We should we should get someone to explore this. Um but the idea of like mm. success what what are the ingredients of success? What causes obsession, grit, drive, these kind of things. Mm-hmm. Um, the deficiencies can in many ways be positives. And yeah, you, you yeah, don't have yeah. to look at them as deficiencies, right? People people say, oh, you know, I, I have only this or only that. Like you have the tools you have, go to the ends of the fucking earth with them mm. is is my opinion. You'll have to yeah. part, pardon my Portuguese there. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to ask you, Ben, what's lost when we listen to music on our AirPods connected to our iPhone. Mm -hmm. When we listen to music playing from our computer, the digital playback of music and this Neil Young Mm -hmm. article, which we both read before the interview, he described the music, his music as played back on an iPhone or a computer as representing 5% of what he had originally recorded. I think an adequate analogy, as I said before, would be the 
chair in the realm of forms and the mm-hmm. chair here in our earthly world or chicken at McDonald's versus chicken at a Michelin starred restaurant. Right. You can recognize, I think Neil Young said in this article, he could recognize some degree of himself and his own music in in the playback. In the same way that mm. when you order a, a chicken sandwich from McDonald's, mm. you can probably, well, in most cases, recognize that this is chicken or there's some chicken in it, right? Mm-hmm. Versus when you eat uh, a chicken at, at some Michelin restaurant, which can be overdone too. Some of these yeah. places are just, yeah. you know, anyway. But like you can recognize more purely the chicken mm-hmm. uh, properly prepared by a, you know, yep the Culinary Institute of America chef versus a packaged preservative, you know, uh, hormone chicken that you get mm. from McDonald's. Mm. Uh, it, it reminds me that the metaphor would be McDonald's is Spotify. Michelin star is playing live, I suppose, yeah. playing live yeah. on an acoustic instrument, maybe mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. rather than an electric instrument. I don't know. But coming back to the question, what's lost when we listen to music played back to us digitally versus live mm. or in some other capacity like vinyl or uh, I don't know. I didn't even know the words for the technology, mm-hmm. but go I didn't know exactly what he was talking about, the sonic resonance. Uh, in yeah, Neil Young. yeah. So, so this is something I've been fascinated by for, for, you know, since I was a teenager listening to the Red Hot Chili Peppers. The Red Hot Chili Peppers were the first band that I seriously listened to. And Under the Bridge. Yeah, Under the Bridge. And I, I went back. Brendan's further. Death Song. Yeah. Um, I, lo- I loved the horn sections that they used to put together on the Subway to Venus um, record. That was, that was what was kind of hooked me. But um, I have a friend in Sydney. You have friends? Uh, yeah, several, Scott. <laughs> Hazard of being me. <laughs> um, I have a friend in Sydney who is the principal trombone of the, the Sydney Symphony. Hmm. And during the pandemic, I went around to his house and he is a renowned audiophile. He may be the biggest audiophile in Australia. Um, he, I mean, he's he's right up there. He has... A, what is an audiophile? Like someone, who loves- someone, someone who is obsessed with the quality of their speakers and the reproduction of sound, right? Yeah, yeah. And I go around to his house during the pandemic. We had lot, like different, you know, we had lots of time. Orchestras weren't performing um, uh, as much. So, and he has these this incredible setup with, you know, two very large speakers, um, a, you know, state-of-the-art deck where he would download lossless files from the internet and then one chair in front of these speakers positioned precisely. And he would say, okay, we're going to listen now to, um, I think we were listening to a Shostakovich symphony, it's Shostakovich 9. And I sat down in the chair and he walked away and he said, he pointed at me, he goes, this is how you listen for form. And I went, okay, that's not what I would have expected to hear. And we talked about it. And and what he was explaining is that apart from the obvious things that get lost, like the guitar sounds duller or... What does dull, what does that mean? Like, or, you know, it loses the, the thing that Neil Young is talking about. Like it it, it loses the qual- the particular quality of the sound effect, right? Um the rawness of the instruments is lost. Apart from all of that stuff, which you recognize straight away, he believes that this lossless, uh, this this uh, kind of um, compression effect that basically starts with recorded sound itself, okay? So it starts with with the record. The record doesn't escape scrutiny and gets to this horrible the vinyl, place. The vinyl. Record, yeah, yeah, vinyl. Yeah. And then, and then or, or just recording of sound full stop, I should say. And has got to this horrible place of compressed, you know, iPod and you know Spotify. What's actually lost is your human uh, capacity to appreciate the form of the artwork itself. That in in essence, uh, what you're being told by recorded sound, and and in, in particular by really poorly recorded sound, uh, reproduced sound, I should say, is that uh, there is an unreality to what's going on. And so, mm. and so, not only do you lose, which the is things, somehow sickening, yeah. And not only, and, and it resonates really with what Neil Young is saying in that article because not only are you losing the obvious things like, oh, it just doesn't sound very good, or, you know, it, or it sounds dull, or the volume's all the same. I'm not surprised by anything anymore. You can't actually apprehend 
the structure of the music as well. That that was his argument. So that is that is something I find extraordinarily fascinating. So repeat that. You can't apprehend. You can't apprehend the structure of the music itself as well anymore. Apprehend means to stop. No, oh. in in this sense, it means means to to be able to um, attach your attention to. So you know, it's a it's a term that will get used in philosophy in 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 the in this context. Like how how do I reach out and grasp? So I guess yeah, to stop. Okay, has the same kind of effect, but um, you can't start to to grasp at the the picture of the form. Um, in other words, if something's written, you know, in a dance form or in sonata form or these, these great classical music forms, your understanding of what is happening in those forms will be blurred by loss by this kind of compressed format. Now, that to me seems at first challenging because I'm saying, well, no. Even if you take the personality out of the music, <clears throat> even if you can't hear the instruments as clearly, uh, you can still, um, you know, you can still hear the structure. Uh, and you're saying, well, yeah, but your attention is is going to be kind of, kind of knocked off kilter by the fact that you're you're having an unreal experience, an increasingly unreal experience with the music. Okay, so that I that I think is something very profound and I think it's something that that Neil Young has realized in some way because what he's saying when when he's writing is there's a personal frustration that I, I went on stage I did this and these you know dickheads at Spotify wrecked it they 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 made me not me but then he's going into this territory where he's talking about you know the, the poisonous effects that this is something that's actually reaching into the soul, and I think what he's what he's recognizing is the unreality of experience on a on a more fundamental level. That 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 what's being communicated is this message of this is not actually a live performance, whereas the initial intention of recorded sound was to say this is actually a live performance. We, we were striving towards improving mm. our, our, our um, capacity to imitate, you know, what was live, to reproduce what was live. Um, I don't know the history of recorded sound particularly well, but, you know, with, with the arrival of vinyl, um, you know, we're, we're striving forward. <coughs> now, what happens when we have the CD is... We actually say, start to say, well, in the interest of, um, let's say, at a best reckoning, just sharing this more widely, being more democratic, um, we might need to compromise a little bit. Um, but on the worst reckoning, in the interest of making more money, um, we're just going to play havoc with people's human attachment to music. And then we wake up in 2023 and we're in hell. And, you know, we have been so habituated to use the, the Aristotelian term. We've been so habituated to uh, a, a way of receiving music that is so unlike, you know, listening to a you know, live string quartet in your home if you're an aristocrat, or listening to a you know a, a gypsy band if you're a peasant. It's so unlike the the the, the human experience of that um, that we're living with something that's that's actually quite different and possibly quite dangerous, it possibly doing real damage to our souls. I think that's, that's what Neil Young has, has really recognized. Yeah, I'm, I don't want to say speechless, but I am without speech. <laughs> um, well, there's time for music then, Scott. Yeah, there's time for music. You could, you could sing for us. Um, I, I mean... When you're listening to compressed sound, it's not just a derivative. It's a derivative of a derivative. Because mm. uh, mm. you can compress sound as much as you want. You can compress the hell out of it. I think if someone played like live, uh, someone was playing the, uh, an acoustic guitar live in, uh, you know, at a radio station, and then that was broadcast, mm. <clears throat> would, that would be slightly better than Spotify, right? Or no, not the, because by the time it reaches your car radio, it gets fucked up. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm asking. I don't know. 
I, I think so. And I, Why? Um, but what's the, okay, you so there's, the, the, do you have the technological well, language a, for this? There's a secondary uh, issue. There's a, there's a sort of knock-on issue that comes into play here, and that's that if uh, we're dealing with, you know, you know, the sludgy porridge, let's call it that, of compressed music, if that's what we're used to hearing and that's what we're habituated to, then generation upon generation – what kind of artist actually gets produced? Well, what gets produced is the kind of artist that doesn't have an incentive to go to the radio station and to do that live performance. So I would say that, you know, yeah, there is something, there is something better. I mean, even if you have crappy speakers or even if you have, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, the loss of quality that comes by being broadcast over the radio waves, yeah, that's still a much better thing to, to have that artist doing that because at least it shows that that person's kind of – that person is kind of broken out of the matrix and they've performed with intention again, right? So, yeah, I mean it's, it's going to have the, the handicaps of technology but that, that is a breaking of the cycle. Hmm. Um, it's not, you know, you know the, the latest version of the movie A Star is Born. You, yeah, you I basically, love that film. Yeah, it's fantastic, right? And you basically see the tragedy of this playing out. Like it's, you know, this this guy, Jackson, is playing in this dingy bar and there's, there's a kind of an authenticity. And then, you know, he brings the girl on board and, and she brings her earnest performer's soul to the art of making music. And then he's over, not playing in a dingy bar. He's a star. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it, what's the what's the scene at the beginning where she first, well, that where he first recognizes her? Are they in a bar then? Uh, th or he hears her in a bar? I yeah. He's he hears her sing at a so, at a, a, a drag club. Right. Sorry. So I got that wrong. So she's the one singing in the in the bar, yeah. right? Drag club. Um, and there's an authenticity to that. And what he's doing is kind of authentic too. Maybe a few steps removed. Um, but then you see the tragedy of her. Yeah. Oh, going, interesting. Going more towards the point the where commercialization. Yeah, the, the, we call it commercialization, and 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 that's what it is. But the the personal effect on her is to strip away the artist's soul. Now you go to the radio station and do a live session that that could be seen as like breaking that cycle Bro, a little bit. Oh, this this is. You know, that's pretty yeah. cool. Well, no, it's devastating. This film mm. brought me to tears. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember uh, actually reviewing it for a class mm -hmm. I was taking at Sydney Uni, uh, and I wrote this heartfelt review. I, I hadn't. Um, I, I, t I, t I took some creative liberties with this review. I remember the reviewer's comments. He said. While interesting and engaging, you draw on none of the course material, <laughs> cite none of the required reading, and uh, unfortunately, uh, I'm not able to give you the mark that I know you would have liked. I don't remember what I got on that. Um, he mm -hmm. goes, I know this will come as a disappointment, but you just didn't do the assignment. You mm. just you just wrote a creative right. review of A Star Is right. Born, which was fantastic, by the way. One of the great... Mm. works of the Western canon, I think, yeah. my the assignment that I turned in. Um, <laughs> I believe... You mean the movie or your assignment no, no, is no, the no, great no, work no, no, of the my, Western canon? My, my, the the, the five-paragraph essay <laughs> okay. that I wrote about this. I believe it It should be taught at St. John's <laughs> and that... I it, can ask it for you. you I, I think I'll send we a mail. We could put on UATX's curriculum. We could. Yeah. We could. Uh, we'll mail it in and we'll say we have a new masterpiece. I'll give you the original draft... You can frame it in a, you know, like a cocktail napkin thing. Right. No. Okay. So I'm thinking about the end of this film mm. where, well, not to spoil too much, but he hangs himself. Yeah. Um, mm. And she sings this song, I'll Never Love Again. Mm -hmm. It is so devastating mm -hmm. to listen to her sing this song. And that like tears are welling up in my eyes listening to this. And... Um, there's another song which she sings in French. Um, 
I can't. Oh, uh, La Vie en Rose, mm-hmm. um, which, which she sings. That 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 is remarkable. I mean, her the ability, her French is remarkable mm-hmm. there, and being a yep. French speaker myself, mm-hmm. um, to he, most Americans are speak trash French. I mean, it's just it's mm-hmm. just horrendous. Um, and so, listening to her, who, to my understanding, is not otherwise a French speaker, sing the song in French was extraordinary, and it makes me think like, can music Offer something else. There's this. There's this old Dracula mm. film, where Dracula. He didn't speak English, but he. They just told him the sounds to make of mm. of, you know, of his lines, and he kind of like reproduced the sounds without <laughs> without knowing what he was saying. The Star is Born. Wonderful, wonderful film. Um, I want to talk to you, Ben. In the, where where you know where. We're deep into the interview, yeah. so I want to talk to you within the last few questions mm. about uh, about some interesting spicy topics, yeah, such yeah. as techno. Mm-hmm. Uh, what's going on in a Berlin basement? So I understand that I, – I, look, I used to be very involved in the underground rave scene in mm-hmm. Australia. I mm-hmm. was going to parties under bridges and tunnels, and I was not wearing clothing like this. Um <laughs> Uh, or at all? <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, there were there were there was some there was some uh, partial nudity. We, you know, typically when it get hot, people would tie their shirts off and put uh-huh. them, tuck them into their jeans like tails. Um, uh, to begin with, there there may have been some other nudity going mm-hmm. around. Can't can't recall. Can't comment. Mm-hmm. Um, no one ask. So, uh, you know, I I'm no stranger to to. Uh, electronic music mm. to techno. Um, we'd listen to acid. Mm-hmm. We'd listen to um, all all different kinds of techno. All to, like not so much electronica, a little bit. Mm-hmm. But look, I, I, I'm not saying it's not music, right? Or, or maybe it's not music. Mm-hmm. But perhaps it falls. Perhaps it's not music, and it falls into some other category. Right, I don't know what that category is or what the classification would be, mm-hmm. but when you listen to Shostakovich's Seventh and you listen to uh, a, a, a hard techno, it doesn't seem to be of the same kind, even in the same way that the McDonald's chicken and the Michelin star chicken would be of the same kind. They seem in some ways to be of different categories. So a lot of people like you mm-hmm. would write off techno and say this is horrendous this is not music mm-hmm. this is this is an abomination mm-hmm. um i love that word abomination <laughs> um this is you know but maybe it's not an abomination it's just not music it's something else it's some other kind of art mm-hmm. uh which which is in its own category mm-hmm. what do you think well i think it's music um you know, my uh, my first thought is it can only be consumed. By the way, th- through it's produced n- electronically. Yeah, yeah. Like it can, and then it, many times it's consumed electronically or even played live. Mm. It's produced not via instruments. Yeah. So I mean, let's let's use like a, a parallel here. So you have you have um, aristocracy, which is you know uh, an an ideal form. Um, or could be an ideal form, and then its distortion uh, is oligarchy. So I think about uh, music like this uh, in this way. I think there's there's kind of there may be an ideal form of music, and then there are um, there are musical regimes, so to speak, which are inherently oppressive. Um, now, that doesn't mean that they're always wholly bad. And that's, you know, we get into difficulties when we just, you know, throw a genre in the in the, the toilet and call it completely irredeemable. And mm. I've certainly been guilty of doing that in, in the past when I've been trying to bring people around to, you know, well, you know, maybe you should try classical music instead of pop and techno. Um, but what, what defines uh, both pop and techno to me is actually a – certain oppressive element okay now i think that that comes in the the you know relative tyranny of 
the beat, um, which then spins out into the rhythm, um, which dictates the relative limitations of the harmony and certainly dictates the, the relative limitations of the melody. Um, all of these elements of music which have been proven to be intrinsic to good music, you know, their, their, their relative freedom, um, you know, the, the, the freedom of a melody to define the, the course of, um, of the way that a, a particular piece of music just comes, comes to one or comes, comes across to one is very important. And what you have in uh, techno is a beat dominated form, which mm -hmm. I, I view as, again. Could you compose techno on the Every Good Boy Deserves Fudge chart? Uh, yeah, sure. You mean you but could. But I mean, I, I know a lot of the DJs don't do that, but you, one you could, could, right? You could. I, I think it would sound some, I, and you know, when I've, when I've been playing around. Is like, there even enough space? I mean, think I, you have 100 beats per, yeah. per it's, it's difficult. I mean, I'm thinking back to my high school music assignments when I probably did something like that to try and shortcut my way through the composition assignments. It'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to com compose this on my computer and see if I can, you know, technify it. it the, the short answer is did it's... They have, it, did they have computers in those days? Yeah, <laughs> it did. <laughs> it wasn't, not, wasn't, wasn't, uh, wasn't quite that long ago. Yeah. But uh, it, uh, it sounds kind of ridiculous to try and to try and merge those worlds and, and plenty of people have, right? But I think the, the, the element that dominates techno is the oppressive beat. Now, someone said to me, uh, Scott, I think this may have been when we, when we first met in, in the, the Britannia class of uh, 2022, that, um, well, don't you think that can be actually expressive of something? Like, why is this, why is techno really popular in East Germany? Yeah, that's it. Let's get into this. That could be because that musical idiom, um, yes, it's oppressive. Yes, it, it grips and, and holds and may have negative implications for people that listen to it. Um, but uh, it's expressive of something true. It's expressive of the true experience of the people enjoying it. Let's let's define some terms here. Oppressive. Mm. How is it oppressive? I understand how an oligarchy is oppressive. How is techno as a musical form with a beat, mm -hmm. oppressive. Is that like a a, a music term, mm -hmm. or what do you mean by that? The beat is computerized, so it is it, it is uh, to the human imagination completely uh, dominated in the sense of its regularity. So you are made aware subconsciously and consciously from the very beginning of any techno piece of music that you are essentially being run by something that is not human. It communicates that, um, you know, explicitly and implicitly. Uh, if you are in dialogue with all the music you listen to, and I would argue that whether we like it or not, we are, um, whether passively or actively, then um, the dialogue that you face with techno uh, is never sort of apprehended, you know, in, in a human term. You, you can't sort of reach out to it in a human sense mm. and say, I think Mozart is you know, leading me here and so he's going to push me here, but then I have the freedom to go here. Um, techno takes it away from you, I think, by, by its, its computerization and its regularity. Some of this music, to be frank, is... It, we can't write off an entire genre mm -hmm. here, but... Well, it, some people want to be ruled and that, that, that it, might be a good thing for them. In my experience of the rave scene, some of this music is designed to be listened to in the accompaniment of drugs, mm -hmm. of illicit substances. And that's part of what you're doing. Mm. You, you would, one would. Mm. I'm not talking about myself necessarily. Mm. One would consume MDMA mm -hmm. and list or whatever or an acid. I mean there's a genre of mm. uh there's a genre of techno music called acid for good reason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You would consume acid and then you would listen to acid mm. music. You would consume MDMA and then go to a rave. MDMA is widely used in in uh in electric electro electric festivals, like uh, techno festivals. Yeah, yeah. Um well it's just part and parcel of, of the the festival experience, right? 
Well, or the festival, the rave experience, it is part and parcel of it. But what, what I'm suggesting is mm-hmm. that the music then, mm-hmm. too, is also part and parcel. And the music is designed to accompany the drugs in the same way that the drugs are there to accompany mm-hmm. the music. Like, there there are some people who listen to mm-hmm. techno on their morning commute. But mm. a lot of... I don't know what I don't I haven't done a, an ethnographic mm-hmm. study here, but dr- the drugs and the music, right? So we're talking about like inhumane experience, mm-hmm. like an oppressive experience, yeah. right? <clears throat> the drug is picking up something, and then the music is is mm-hmm. picking something else up, and there there's a kind of interplay there where people talk about or. In my recollection, people described being able to feel the music. Literally, yep. in some cases, the the speaker was so loud that it was pulsing through them. Mm. But they taught. I heard people describe sensations of being able to feel the beat inside of them, yep. to feel this music, and get lost in that. Mm-hmm. In a combination of drugs, music, and then lots of other people around you doing the exact same thing. Yeah. I, look, I think I think that's. That's an extremely valid uh, and important observation. And I think um, I, I would say, firstly, you never write off anyone's, you know, positive experience of, of music. Um, even, and it's not my scene, even if that means, you know, that person is reliant on other substances in order to complete that picture. Uh, what I would be interested in uh, is to see if uh, we did that, you know, as a as a as a as a regular kind of activity. If you could create the conditions in society where uh, everybody could take some drugs and listen to three or four hours of rave music, what in kind daylight. of yeah? What kind of effect would that have on, um, you know, Not our, our, our civilization? Now, I'm, I, I don't even want to judge it. I, I could be, you know, I know I've seen video of Elon Musk going, you know, it's time for me to, to just rave out. And then he's, he'll go and, you know, disappear to Ibiza for a little while and, and rave out. Maybe that has a really positive impact on the work that he does. I don't, I don't know. What I can say is that, uh, this period that we call the Enlightenment, which uh, you know we see a you know a complementary and coincident relationship between philosophy and music and science and uh, technology and social freedoms, um, that belongs to an age where the dominant mode of music making um, for let's 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 be honest for educated people, so the people that were going to the universities and coming up with these inventions and writing this philosophy, um, is a music based in the Western tonal classical tradition. So there would be a strong uh, empirical argument to say that classical music may be responsible for, uh, at the very least, um, accompanying uh, some of the most productive activity that our civilization has ever seen and, and beneficially productive. And I think that is, that is, that's the caution that I would, I sometimes put on the argument where people will say, well, you know, we should just be able to listen to whatever we want to listen to and, you know, different, different horses for different courses. And I, I do agree. Um, but I would just draw people's attention to, some of the evidence from history to to show where classical music has accompanied our civilization. It's a good point, mm. and uh, I'm 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 not necessarily a preservationist. Mm. I believe in innovation and change yeah. and yeah. stuff, but I, I also don't think that we need to reinvent the wheel. Mm. Um, certain things have carried us through dark times in human civilization, and there's mm. no need to turn our backs on a, on a wonderful cultural inheritance. I had Heather McDonald on mm. this podcast. It's great on music. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I had her on talking mm. about classical music and yep. classical music's suicide pact mm-hmm. is what she called it. Yeah. She was writing for, uh, um, 
City Journal. Yeah, City yeah. Journal. Yeah. Um, we had her on talking about that, and uh, it was it was fascinating. Um, t- she was talking about like um, I think I think she called it the the uh, the preservation of the guardians or turning her back on the guardian, like where the guardians. Uh, the betrayal of the guardian, mm-hmm. so, something of this nature, mm-hmm. um, of how yeah we don't need to re- reinvent the wheel mm. entirely. Um, there are things that work and have worked for a long time, and uh, maybe we shouldn't tear it all down. Maybe maybe post structuralism, uh, the the birth child of postmodernism, isn't necessarily a good idea. Mm. But uh, well, you can go, respond to that if you want. Yeah, well, I would go back. Uh, Somewhat to, to to our discussion earlier on physics, hmm. uh, the the classical tradition, um, certainly as it existed up to the early part of the the twentieth century, uh, when you had the emergence of the second Viennese school, and Schoenberg and Berg and their disciples, um, was built on what we just commonly understand as tonal harmony, right? Now, tonal harmony itself. Uh, is based in physical properties. So let's you know, boil it down to something really simple. Um, the octave, the major triad, why broadly uh, do they sound good? It's not just that you know we've attached this meaning that you know that that's the happy triad and that the minor triad we've attached this meaning of that that's the that's the unhappy triad. Um, Although those are very important, you know, the, the cultural attachments that we have to different different sounds and different harmonies. Uh, there is a physical truth in the way that an octave resonates very simply. It's a, it's a you know, and I, I, I don't know all of the ratios of all the notes because I, I haven't, you mm. know, uh, gotten into the physics of music. But the octave resonates relatively, um, you know, is, is, a, is a repetition of a frequency. Mm. Um, so <clears throat> there's a truth in the way that that tradition comes down to us. And when Heather says things, you know, to that nature that we don't need to reinvent the wheel, yeah, it's it's obvious that we don't need to reinvent the wheel because um, that truth should should actually be recognizable. And so long as we're human beings living in this world, in this atmosphere, with this, you know, air pressure under these circumstances, fundamentally... Um, you know, war and peace will come, but it's going to stay the same as far as we know. Um, that that truth is actually preserved in in the Western tonal tradition. Now, as you very correctly pointed out, it's it's important to innovate, but um, the innovation has to come from within. And mm-hmm. philosophers understand this. You know, you, you can't just Stand make up a new system in a vacuum. Yeah. It just doesn't work. It it um, it has to come from within and it has to build consonantly on what's come before. That's why Wagner's Tristan chord works. It's, it does look forward, but it's consonant with the past accumulation of harmony. That is why the 12 tone system, yes, it works, but it works in a qualified sense. It's true to its own theoretical reckoning. It is not true to the oral reckoning of the person that has absorbed tonal harmony to date. Mm. So, yes, I, innovation in classical music is a devilish problem right now because where do you go after you've had these, you know, post-enlightenment composers? I mean, you have Beethoven, you have Brahms, uh, and then you have Strauss and Mahler come along and they're kind of making everything even bigger and more strained. Uh, and then Schoenberg, you know, quite rightly asks the question: well, What are we supposed to do? Just we can't just keep making these pretty sounds. Uh, but you know, you know, the, a lot of the contemporary reckoning of classical music that comes from that train of thought of needing to innovate, I think, got things wrong. You know, they 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 created musical knowledge in a vacuum. Uh, if you look at and this is very exciting, you know, to, to look at what happened in maybe Central and Eastern Europe in the 20th century uh, with uh, Zimanowski, um, Bela Bartok, you know, really sought to reorient classical mm. music to folk traditions but still in a very modern language. Um, that may be pointing more to the future of innovation 
uh, in in the sonic reckoning of our classical tradition. A few things come to mind. First of all, another Borges short story. Mm -hmm. uh, Talon, Ukbar, uh, and Tertius uh, something. Mm -hmm. um, Talon, Ukbar, so you, mm -hmm. you'll be able to find it. Um, he, he, he writes about this totally made up world with inverted physical property, not even mm -hmm. inverted, but just distorted physical properties and distorted language. And he's having fun. I can see this guy sitting back, sipping Malbec and like trying to create the most ridiculous world possible. So you mm -hmm. said you can't just create something from scratch. Mm -hmm. uh, you can, but the issue with creating something from scratch is that you don't benefit from the rich tradition of thousands of years of people before you mm -hmm. who dedicated their lives to to creating things which were pretty cool mm -hmm. um we built pyramids and came up with all kinds mm -hmm. of cool technology but i want to i want to uh round out here mm -hmm. with with a question for you what comes to mind here is well, a question for you i've asked you plenty of questions now i'm going to ask another um Stockholm syndrome comes to mind, mm -hmm. right? You flick on the top 40s in the United States and you hear nothing against these people necessarily, but you hear Doja Cat or Nicki Minaj or, you know, artists of this nature, a lot of pop, a lot of mm -hmm. hip hop, a lot of rap. Um, if I had to gander, I'd say that's not your chosen cup of gin. Just, just a hunch, just a hunch. Um, but ultimately, we have a free market economy, and the economy awards people who sell. I mean, there's a demand for these things, right? Like these albums are selling because people are buying them. If there weren't a demand, these artists wouldn't be popular. And there's a lot of copycats. There's a lot of people like them. They, but the American public in many ways and the, the global public, these pe people go on tours all over the world, mm -hmm can't get enough of this kind of stuff. So my question to you, we, we began by talking about America. Mm. I wonder if our taste in rap and hip hop and affiliated genres reveals, which is by the way, played over compressed sound most mm -hmm. of the time. Few people hear these artists perform live uh, Mm. And these artists, in many cases, don't make efforts to like perform live too often in, in front of others in the same way that mm. perhaps Neil Young would. So it, it's not even a knock on the genre. Uh, mm. Even I'm not asking you to criticize the genre mm -hmm. because you don't like it. I'm just saying there is a kind of music that is popular now. And mm. it's the only reason that it continues to proliferate is because of the free market. The free market is rewarding this. It's enormously mm. profitable too. So my, my, my question is this, does this reveal a kind of sickness in America, a kind of Stockholm syndrome, wherein people are so used to hearing compressed sound, this sort of unreal sound, whether mm. it's it's not just Beethoven played over Spotify, it's, it, it's anything played over mm. Spotify. And most of the stuff people are listening to on Spotify, if I had to look at the numbers, would probably not be Beethoven. It would be, mm. you know, Doja Cat and, and whatever. Yeah. And I, I listen to some of this music and I like some mm. of it. Um, but the, like, the fact that our top 40s is dominated by a lot of, you know, rap, hip hop, uh, affiliated kind of genres. I just wonder if this shows that we've become so used to uh, this unhumane, unreal, or inhumane, unreal sound against which Neil Young spent much of that article railing. And whether we're not just used to it, but we've convinced ourselves that we like it and that we need it via a perverse Stockholm syndrome. So... What would handsome young Ben Crocker say on the matter? Well, there's a lot in that question, uh, but I don't know if it but, even was a question. No, to it's be it's it's a really good question. It, it 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 gets to the crisis of our our time. I think. First, let me say I'm I'm a believer in the market. I'm a I'm a believer in a big market. I I so am I. Yeah. I am not a um, 
I am not one to say that even that we should be interfering um, with the market in favor of our own preferences. Um, I think if you look back through time, you know, more benefit has flowed to more people from just open sourcing the, the way that we, uh, you know, receive music. Now, I think that one of the downsides of uh, opening yourself to the market is needing to accept that not only is there going to be a proliferation of, you know, good things and bad things and, you know, yeah, things we're ambivalent about uh, in the market at any one time, over the span of, you know, years and decades and centuries, if, if you persist with it, there are going to be cycles where the population is maybe more possessed of low tastes and then cycles where the population is more possessed of higher tastes. By um, by what def I mean by perhaps your definition, probably mine e too. Exactly. But, yeah. So so from the from the from the standpoint by different tastes, not high or low. Yeah. 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 Well, no. From, from my standpoint, it, I can yeah. I can look and say, well, the market. Well, one one is more complex. Yes. Okay. The, I, the, the market in 1930 had the the Boston Symphony Orchestra could sell out a stadium for five nights in a row and play one of the great symphonies from the Western canon. Um, and they can't do that now, but you can have Nicki Minaj on Spotify. So I would look at that and say, well, I think the general public were probably doing better in 1930. But that said, that is, that's an acceptance that you have to make if we say we're going to live with a free market. And I'm a believer in a free market, so I have to accept that. But I also uh, include, you know, the, the counter push of, you know, what people like me might be interested in or, you know, mothers who when they homeschool their children during the pandemic were starting to realize, oh, I don't know if I want my child listening to that piece of music in the classroom. And, you know, I've, I feel a lot of inquiries, you know, now through, through the, the different channels that I work in from people saying, how can we get our souls involved in classical music? You know, what can I do for my child? Why is that happening? Well, because we have a free market. So the, the market has gotten us maybe to a bad place, but the market also allows the response. It allows me to come and talk to Scott yeah, Newman. Of course, right? of course. So that, that's to say that there's kind of like, you know, uh, the, the virtue of just taking your hands off and allowing things to work. That said, uh, we have these good things to hang our hat on um, because they come from – Errors, perhaps um, there are there are, are ideals forms that come down from times where maybe things were uh, a little more tightly controlled, where um, you know patronage within a court that generated a symphony, um, you know was 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 maybe a little too exclusive for the time for our, for our liking, but gave to posterity, gave to history. Um, something truly great. So that's a, that's a really, really big challenge is you, you sort of look out at the world and you think, well, how do we actually create the conditions for an era of, of great art? And sometimes that, that does, you know, need to come with, you know, uh, you know, may, might be in, in our modern day, it might be a nation state that um, more narrowly conceives of what it will and won't fund in, in the arts and says, well, you know, we can see the carnage taking place, so we're you know we're going to do this and oh, come know. on, I'm sure that happens, right? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, uh, you know, I think I think the seeds of renewal are kind of being planted, and when we look at at the world today and see what's going on, it's it's pretty easy to despair. But you know, there's there's always shoots of green. The other thing uh, on the the topic of Stockholm syndrome that I would say is. Yeah, um, let's get into this. Yeah. This is interesting. Right. This so, is self-perpetuating. Yep. Why is the market rewarding this? The market's yep. rewarding it because there's a demand for it. Mm -hmm. Why is there a demand for mm -hmm. it? Why do people like this so much? There's a lifestyle element to the fact that rappers are cool. They have lots of mm -hmm. pretty girls around them with not a lot of clothing mm -hmm. on and, you know, uh, fancy cars and throwing money around. That's cool. Mm -hmm. Rock stars, same thing. There's yeah. a lifestyle element to it. Yeah. The lifestyle... 
gets is is a selling point of the music in the same way that the music is a selling point of the lifestyle. You rap yeah. about fucking these many girls and having this car mm -hmm. and this mm -hmm. private plane. And so it's all the music feeds off of the lifestyle. The lifestyle feeds off of the music. Teenage boys or teenage girls, what mm -hmm. do they want to listen to? They want to they, they see this fantastic. I mean, this is also like runaway American experiment. Yeah. It used to take two, three generations, probably like three generations mm -hmm. to see the fruits of social mobility, right? Your parents come yep. over from Europe or wherever. Yeah. They, you know, work hard, give the kids a better lives. Those parents make their kids study a lot, give them education. Mm -hmm. Then those, they grow up and then their kids are the ones who've moved up in social classes over like three generations. Now we're, it's become compressed. So it's yep. not even two, three generations. It's two or three years mm -hmm. where people want to go from like TikTok star or rock star or whatever. You get signed by, mm -hmm. uh, by some big yeah. music label, you're minted, right? Mm -hmm. Like then you, that, that's, that's mm -hmm. awesome. And so kids looking at this, th there's been a perversion of the American dream in that it's, We've we've fallen in love with the the product rather than the process of it, and I'm not saying it's not a good thing that this has been condensed from three mm -hmm. generations into three years. Mm -hmm. In some cases, that's a that that is a cool thing, right? Mm -hmm. And but not only in America, but certainly it would be characteristic of America that this can happen. All mm -hmm. right, so I understand that there's a selling of this lifestyle. There's a selling of prosperity almost and mm -hmm. you listen to drake saying i'm the greatest you know some people like that they think i'm like him now mm -hmm. a lot of they're not they're not willing to do in the work mm -hmm. but there is a element of that <laughs> i just mm -hmm. read a book that you would most likely abhor um tropic of cancer by henry miller okay. uh where he he's describing the differences it's it's a piece of avant-garde literature mm -hmm. it's very obscene um, I don't know. Maybe you would like it. Maybe I don't know you well enough. But um, <laughs> he, anyway, he he's describing the difference between France and America. And he says, everyone in America grows up thinking that one day they could be president of the United States. Mm -hmm. People in France grow up thinking that they're going to die exactly where they were born <laughs> and live a much more local existence. Mm -hmm. They have no interest in becoming Prime Minister uh, or uh, or whatever other cabinet position mm. of, of of France, and so th there's less ambition, if you want to call it that. There's much more of a mm -hmm. focus on the good. I mean, this is Greek, like the good life and good wine, good meals. Why did the French take two hours for lunch? Mm -hmm. You know, it seems like ever any time. I was just living in Paris. Um, I just moved back to New York from Paris. Mm -hmm. It seemed like any hour of the day, there's people out drinking coffee and thinking, when did these fucking people get any work done? But France has one of the largest economies in Europe, uh, besides, of course, Germany. Mm. They they are getting some work done. You mm. know, I, I don't know exactly what the mechanisms of it are, but they're they're producing something. Mm. So America doesn't necessarily have that culture of like leisure and of of, mm -hmm. of localism. They do have that striving big i'm going to be president yeah. i'm going to be yeah. i'm going to be a billionaire yeah. this is a billionaire phenomenon the the mm -hmm. three comma club phenomenon yeah. everyone wants to be a millionaire um people want to be uh, billionaires they want to be like who are kids heroes they're sports stars mm -hmm. um in some cases they're composers but not for the average yeah. average yeah. joe so the question here is the stockholm syndrome we have fallen in love with a perverted and inhumane style of listening to sound and then the sound which we are listening to which could be beethoven is not beethoven mm -hmm. it's you know drake and Nicki minaj and mm -hmm. these people so that's what i would sprinkle into yeah. the sunday here for you to play yeah. with so this is how i've been i've, I've been using uh, aristotle recently to get to get at this problem of of stockholm syndrome because it's very real right and uh, so book two and three of, uh, I think it's book two and three of Aristotle's Ethics, uh, he draws our attention to this problem of habituation, right? Now, in a very simple sense, you know, you can say, well, America is habituated to, to bad music. That's a true statement. But the Aristotelian conception of Habituation is a is a little bit, little bit more nuanced than that. Um, 
if and, and and what we're really what he's really pointing to is the quality of soul that's cultivated uh, in a person. So if you um, are habituated to the good, and let's say let's just keep it in musical terms, um, and let's say if you're habituated to good music, um, you know music that uplifts the human spirit, uh, music that you know objectively uh, was the at the high pinnacle of you know you know classical musical creativity. If you're habituated to that music, so if you've been brought up well, if you have listened to it a lot, if you've learned to preference it, then you will reach out for that music as the good for you. You you will you'll okay, exposure act. therapy. Yeah. Now, conversely, if your quality of soul has been shaped by bad things. And I do believe, I personally believe there is a difference between good music and bad music and there's always subjective interpretation but I think there are objective qualities that good music has. If you're habituated to bad music, then not only um, is that in and of itself just a bad thing but you will reach out for the bad music yeah. as, as the thing that you want. You say that, that in other words... It might appear to you as the bad being your good. Now, I think that that is what's happening in uh, America today. I've, I said this uh, in a talk in England two weeks ago. What do people say when they listen to Taylor Swift? Or why do people say that they like Taylor Swift today? I love Taylor today? Swift. They say, and Taylor Swift is someone who self-consciously writes music for women in their 20s through their 30s, right? What do people say about Taylor Swift? It's not, it's not oh, I, I really like the way she did that song. It's not the Neil Young kind of thing. It's not like, what on earth is he doing there? I mean, that, that's interesting. Gee, that's weird. I'll have to listen to that again. That's a kind of Neil Young conversation. People say about Taylor Swift, they say, oh, man, that song is about me. That song is about me. Mm. And then you know what they say? People who like Beyonce say the same thing. We don't need to just keep it on, on Taylor. They say, oh, that, that song's about me. Man, how did she know that? And then I, I look at these people and I say, you're, you're, you're about a limited chord progression and, and a vocal range which is diminishing year on year from this young lady who was very talented but, but who was increasingly compressing the nature of what she's doing. You're about the same story every time, it's just in different shades. Like you're, you're kind of in jail. You're, you're, in, you're, you're, you're habituated to this. So you've, you've convinced yourself through the accumulation of your listening habits that you are a smaller version of what you actually are. Mm. So this is a you know, devastating problem. Because what do people do when they're, when they're sort of trapped in that, that vice? They, they sort of go, well, all right, I feel really bad today. Um, our music's going to help me. And, and so they should, as, as per Neil Young. You know, Neil Young, you know, adamant about this. But they don't reach out for the highest version of themselves. They reach out for the lowest version of themselves. And that's a real tragedy, you know. And, I, and I'm all for listening to different kinds of music I listen to you know I listen to music that I would call bad all the time I enjoy it I have a, a kind of funny habit of whenever I'm on an airplane whenever I'm taking off or I'm landing I just play something cheap and exciting it just, just kind of feels good to me right uh, but I think I'm lucky to not be habituated to it like I find it trying after you know five minutes uh, and I think the, the challenge is to to say to people, look, there is a there is a bigger and better version of you, and the listening that comports with that version uh, is is not going to be what's playing on Spotify or the radio right now. Uh, I, th I think that's the that may be that kind of skeleton key to getting out of this Stockholm syndrome. So, just a few a few final things here. How would you suggest that people consume music? It's not it? through Spotify. Yeah, how would like literally? Mm, what well, technology? 
Yeah. How he, else do you listen to music on your way to work? Yeah, Neil well, Young talked about this Pono player. The 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 thing I, I say this, and I, I I talk to you know mothers about the you know what should I do for my child? Maybe not the only reason this guy's talking mm. to mothers. <laughs> Scott, Be careful. that's terrible. <laughs> Uh, but I talk, I talk to mothers about what they should listen to their, their children, uh, what, what their children should listen to. And uh, I say to them, well, do you play the piano? And sometimes they go, yeah, I mean, I used to learn, so I'm, I'm okay. I said, well, get a piano. And just, you know. You can't, but just, people can't yeah, afford okay. a piano. And not everyone can do that. But that's, that's why I'm saying in an ideal world, yeah. you put your children, you habituate your children okay. to real music played in a real setting. Could, what about a flute? Right? That's cheaper, right? It might be, yeah, but it's probably less commonly learned. I'm, so, I'm just saying that's yeah. one one instance, yeah. right? The next instance, if I was guitar, talking, because you could buy a guitar. If I was talking to a group of young New Yorkers and they were like, "How can I get better at music?" I said, "Well, don't listen to recorded music. You have a great city full of live music. It's not as good as it's ever been, but it's still pretty good. Go and listen to it live. That's what Neil Young says, right? Yeah, the speakers probably aren't good. The venue's probably gotten used to cheapening, you know." Times are tough. They might not have the best reproduction, but it's a lot better because you're training the instinct for creation, not the instinct for reproduction. It's interesting that after my comment about mothers, you repeated the word reproduction twice. <laughs> it's inappropriate, Scott. <laughs> it is. So, um, look, a few other things. Solipsism and Hannah Arndt. Solipsism, mm -hmm. us, our being in jail, mm -hmm. right? There's this idea, there's, this, there's a solipsistic notion that this is about me. This is about me, mm -hmm. right? That itself it has a jailing effect. Mm -hmm. um, as does as does shooting up again. Mm -hmm. You're having a bad day. What do you do? Mm. You turn on low quality music consumed via a low quality method, and that's kind of akin to shooting up, injecting yeah. again yeah. in some ways. And then the about me thing. This is about me. Yeah, man, I love Tay Tay. I'll sing I'll sing a lot. Actually, uh, my uh, my beloved girlfriend who's here with us today in the studio and I were reprimanded by my neighbor this morning for well, I was belting out lyrics to Bulletproof by LaRue, uh, much to mm -hmm. the chagrin of the other inhabitants of the building and uh, and my girlfriend. But um, I, don't, I don't know why that piece of information mm -hmm. is relevant other than that it's humorous. But I, I, these three things come to mind. One is the shooting up again. The other is solipsism. And the three is Hannah Arndt, the banality of evil, right? Mm -hmm. We're not mm – -hmm. it's, it's this concept of habituation. Hannah may have even been drawing on Aristotle there. Like if you become habituated to bad music, you can't even – recognize that it's bad and, mm -hmm. and then the Stockholm syndrome it's not even that you can't recognize it's bad you learn to like it like there's this you know the David Foster Wallace mm -hmm. uh, what is water speech yeah. um, you you know the fish the fish swimming along they, mm -hmm. they don't recognize what water is um, there actually I'll say the full thing for the audience who hasn't listened there's two f two young fish swimming along and then an old fish swims past he says hey boys how's the water and one of the young fish turns to the other fish and says what the hell is water um <laughs> so the water is you know like you don't mm. realize that it's all around mm. us you become so habituated to listening mm. to bad music that you can't even recognize it in some ways, it's the same thing with Instagram or TikTok or social media. Like the best thing you can do is withdraw for a little while, detox. Yeah. Don't listen to music. Yeah. See, listen to live music if you can. Mm. And it's not like cold turkey. Like maybe just listen to Spotify a bit um, or listen mm. to it a couple hours a week rather than 50 yeah. hours a week, you know? Yeah. On the other hand, people are going to consume this podcast uh, in audio mm. format over... Spotify and Apple Podcasts and Substack and, and YouTube and wherever else they watch it. Mm. So uh, the, there's a small irony on me that's not lost. I It does make it accessible mm. to the masses. Uh, we can't invite the world into this studio. There'll be people in many different countries listening to this. That's, that's a mm -hmm. cool thing. That's a product of technology in the same way that people get to listen to music all over the world. Yeah. Um, so... Pluses and minuses with with everything. Mass distribution uh, is wonderful. It comes at a cost. We take 
measures to edit this to the mm. extent that we can, such that the sound quality is is uh, as best as it can be yeah, given yeah. the circumstances. So I would have thought on this and, and I have on a- On what particular? I said a lot of stuff. Yeah, well, let, let me say this. I, I have a colleague of mine at Common Sense Society where I, where I uh, do a lot of work in, in DC. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Josh Mitchell, who's a senior fellow there, and uh, is a is a Georgetown guy, a, a professor of political f- philosophy at, at Georgetown. Josh uh, is really onto this topic of citizen competency. Now, how does that relate to the kind of things that we're talking about? Well, I would say that listening to music uh, is a life competency. It's something that we de- have developed. We developed it in a particular way. Do you want to put it on a voting test? Maybe. I think, I think, it, I mean, you don't want to ask me that question. You'll yeah. get a dangerous answer. But, <laughs> but, uh, but I, maybe. But you, you got to ask yourself, how, how competent are you at listening to music? Now, you don't have to have a good musical ear. You don't have to know, you don't need to know anything about, you know, the theoretical structures of music. But uh, there is a, I would say that the pursuit of citizen competency is something that you need, that we could do well with understanding. Now, what does that mean? Now, when I was listening to music for the first time, I I can probably remember being maybe five or six years old, my parents, uh, you know, and we, we didn't grow up with much money, but it was pretty hard if you were going to be interested in music to not do it properly. Mm. So, you know, we didn't spend a fortune on a state-of-the-art stereo system, but I remember the first one we had had two pretty big, good speakers, record player, all the records, um, but, you know, and had good good wiring and, you know, it takes some competency to put that together. You know, it takes time. Now, you, now, you know, you, you sort of think, well, there's these audio files that that's their domain. You know, that's the thing that they worry about. And this was good enough for me. Um but I think any, any aspect, and this is not just limited to music, any aspect of living, and this is something that the French do understand pretty well, right? Any aspect of living that you can gain a competency in is worth you gaining a high competency in. Mm. And music is one of those things. Um, Fundamentals of life. How to, how to go on holidays, if, if, you, if, you, if you're um, you know, well off enough to be able to go on holidays, you develop a competency in how to do that well. You know what airlines not to travel with. You know that there's certain times of the day and certain airports you're just not going to travel through, right? Um, I put music into that basket of citizen competencies. Uh, and the more, but more important than taking vacation, I would say. I would say because you, you can actually live with it every yeah. day, Yeah. right? Um, you know, some, some people are very good. At, at eating well, even on a budget. It's just, they just know what to do. They've spent time figuring that out. Now, in our quest to have it all, we tend to sort of neglect all of the individual competencies for the broad competency of just like being everybody, you know, doing everything, having a big life. Mm. You know, we're pretty competent at calendars these days. Actually, you're kind of very competent at calendars these days. We, we, we're good at the organizational science of how to live big. Um, we're getting worse at the particular competencies of how to live well. Mm. And man, music is definitely one of those. Music is a requisite yeah. element of eudaimonia, you would yeah. say. Mm-hmm. Benjamin Crocker, thanks so much for coming on to 27 Rouge. My pleasure, Scott. Thanks no, for having me. Pleasure. <laughs>